we go straight to an interview with a pro-life Catholic member of Congress to address research funding of aborted baby body parts. CNS News broke the story last week. The National Institutes of Health signed a $13.8 million contract with the University of California at San Francisco to obtain aborted baby body parts to implant into mice for research. The report follows the cancellation of a similar FDA contract for aborted baby parts last month. Joining us now from Lincoln, Nebraska, is Representative Jeff Fortenberry. Congressman, welcome back to the program. Catherine, always a pleasure. Thank you for your good work. Absolutely. First off, Congressman, what is your reaction to this $13.8 million contract involving research for aborted baby body parts? Well, first of all, as you're aware, it's prohibited that uh, body parts from aborted unborn children uh, should be sold. And so to have another venue now in which our government is entangled with this unethical behavior is deeply disturbing. As you pointed out, the, there was a contract that the FDA approved earlier to the Trump administration's credit. Uh, they canceled that contract and are doing an investigation as to uh, how this could have happened. But I think the deeper question that's begged here is the ethic. Uh, what is going to be our ethic moving forward in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. And it really needs to revolve around two words, human dignity. In most, I assume, embryology textbooks, it used to be at the University of Nebraska, life is defined at the moment of conception. Mm -hmm. Everything that's genetically that genetically makes us up is present there at the moment of conception. So that is the reasonable, logical, scientific position. But now we have a new ethic emerging that science can do whatever it wants, whatever it can, versus whatever it ought. And what we ought to be doing is good science, reasoned research that protects the inherent dignity of all life, no matter how small, and not getting confused about this ethic because it will lead to monstrous outcomes potentially. You were one of the 85 members of Congress who signed a letter objecting to a previous contract involving baby body parts. Congressman, why do you think, why is this continuing? Well, it's up to me, it's up to uh, you, it's up to the larger pro-life community in America to speak clearly, to speak consistently about an ethic that where no person or no thing is ever thrown away. And so this idea that we could lift uh, by baby body parts that from abortion and somehow turn it into some good is a deep, deep contra contradiction and wounds, of course, those of us who are pro-life and don't want our taxpayer dollars entangled with this. But it speaks to this contradiction of an ethic where no person, no thing should ever be thrown away. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a harder question because we're at a crossroads, I think, in terms of our political community, in terms of our culture, as to where we are going to go. And again, if we would go back to the basics of science, that everything present for life is there at the moment of conception, and build from there about a culture of commitment, no matter how hard the circumstances, and a science that is focused on what we ought to do to save lives and pre prevent disease. We won't get into this dystopia, this distortion, the Hunger Games, where the strongest survive, those with the most political power are those who are simply be looking to profit from unethical research. And that's where we are at a crossroads. So it's a deep both political question as well as a cultural question. But you ask it the right way. How in the world does this keep happening? Mm -hmm. One thing that gives me a little bit of hope, though, is your generation, the next generation coming up. They're seeing this contradiction for what it is. They are very empathetic and relational. They want to be inclusive and uphold the value of diversity. But how can we do so when we're excluding an entire group of persons, the unborn child or the mother that brings them into the world. How can we do that? It's a grave contradiction. So you have this new movement of young people wrestling philosophically with this, and hopefully that makes some political differences over time. But in Congress right now, that is, this is a very deeper fight. You have very hostile voices against any idea that would promote this consistent ethic of human dignity that life begins at conception is worthy of protection, and science ought to adhere to that ethic. At the very least, we ought to keep taxpayer dollars entangled from promoting a distorted ethic like this. Turning now to the midterms, as November 6th is rapidly approaching, there have been a lot of discussions about Senate races, but what would you say, Congressman, to voters about the importance of maintaining a pro-life House of Representatives? 
Do not overlook the House of Representatives. Um, for instance, we just went through a very difficult appropriations uh, budgetary process. A lot of the outcomes are, are somewhat disappointing to the pro-life community in that organizations like Planned Parenthood completely entangled with the abortion industry. Funding is not completely removed from them. However, something that is overlooked is the fact that educational funds, almost $200 million of which would have gone to uh, Planned Parenthood for comprehensive sex education are now no longer there. That is a very significant pro-life victory. It does not happen without a House of Representatives that is decidedly pro-life, that is pursuing reasoned policies based upon sound science, or at the very least, assuring that the taxpayer that their dollar is not entangled with subsidies to the abortion industry. Uh, secondly, uh, the issue of the court system. Uh, now, that's not directly involving the House of Representatives. It involves the Senate. But nonetheless, having people with a pro-life ethic invite others to the case, press their viewpoint through a reasoned manner, and vote, be engaged in the political process, makes a difference on who you send there. You have very hostile voices, such as Chuck Schumer or Patty Murray, who are opposing anything like even protections for conscience rights for health care workers. This is a very difficult fight. And third, again, I think it's very important to look at the victories that we have already made, not just in terms of stopping certain funding, like I mentioned earlier, but earlier, as, as, as little as 20 years ago, only about a third of the House of Representatives considered themselves to be pro-life. Now over half do. These are gains. Mm -hmm. These are small, incremental, but essential gains to trying to shift ourselves to a culture of commitment, a culture of compassion, a culture of inclusion for all persons, no matter how small. And if we don't participate in the process, this doesn't happen. So, Catherine, congratulations to you. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to EWTN. Thank you to everyone who listens to this very important program mm -hmm. for year after year, doing the hard, difficult, messy business in an imperfect environment of trying to move us to this culture of compassion, this culture of community, this culture of commitment to all of those, even the least among us. It's very important that we stay engaged and the basic duty of a good citizen, of a pro-life citizen, is of course to vote. Representative Jeff Fortenberry of Nebraska, thank you so much for your time today, especially in this busy time ahead of midterms. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much, Catherine.